Good afternoon. I'm Katie Cottingham, and welcome to this news briefing from the 251st National Meeting and Exposition of the American Chemical Society in San Diego. We're joined today by Dr. Greg Thurber from the University of Michigan. He will be talking to us about a pill that could improve breast cancer diagnoses. Dr. Thurber? All right, thank you very much for that introduction. So in our lab, what we're interested in doing is being able to diagnose disease specifically at a very early stage. So as many of you may know, breast cancer is a very prevalent form of cancer in women, and it is the second deadliest cancer in this population. And in the national news, uh, you will often see some debate about when the appropriate time to start mammography is uh, in screening for this disease. And so there are trade-offs in starting screening early uh, versus starting it later in life. And a lot of these boil down to the fact that mammography is an imperfect screening mechanism. So there are some women that are identified as having cancer uh, by a mammography that are by a mammogram that do not have it. And there are also some patients who are missed in that screening method. And because some of these patients are incorrectly diagnosed as having cancer, they undergo treatment. And in fact, there was a recent study out last year indicating that uh, these women are that are being treated that do not actually uh, benefit from the treatment are costing about, um, or the cost associated with that are about $4 billion per year. And so not only is there a uh, human element, uh, these patients are being treated and suffering uh, where they don't need treatment, but there's also a heavy financial burden on the market. And so what we want to do in our lab is, is see if there's a better way, a more efficient way of screening uh, for the disease. So one of the major problems with mammography is that it's basically taking an x-ray of the breast tissue, taking a picture, and then from that trying to identify what lumps or lesions are cancerous versus those which are benign. And so you're getting a picture of these lesions, but you're not getting any molecular information about what's going on within that abnormality. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is develop a molecular probe, meaning a molecule that specifically binds to cancer, but not to benign forms of the disease, such that we can detect it and more effectively determine whether this patient needs to undergo treatment. Now, there are a lot of limitations to screening methodologies, and what we're developing is a novel approach where we develop a molecule that has a fluorophore attached to a probe that binds to the cancer that is orally available. So essentially, the patient would take a pill a day or two before they come into the office, and that pill would be absorbed by the digestive tract, bind to the tumors, and then the physician could take a uh, red light pain-free, uh, needle-free, and screen the uh, breast tissue to look for these tumors. So that's what's illustrated in the first slide. Good. And so this is a very challenging task to try and get the right molecular properties uh, for a molecule that is efficiently absorbed in the gastrointestinal tract, uh, but also binds to the cancer. And so we... Uh, initially did a computer screen to look for probes that had the appropriate properties. We um, synthesized several probes that had uh, ideal properties. We tested them in mice, which you can see on the left, and we identified a compound that was efficiently ab absorbed uh, when delivered into the stomach of mice, so uh, oral delivery, uh, as well as targeting the tumor. So you can see the red arrows are highlighting the flank in the upper left-hand corner for uh, the top compound. So this was an initial screening test in the bottom right, then we moved on to a breast cancer model. So this is uh, human breast cells that are grown in the mammary fat pad of the mouse. And we again gave the same probe and you can see over time, especially after one and two days, you have very high uptake in the mammary tumors uh, indicated by the white arrowheads. 
And so finally, what we're currently doing is uh, scaling this up to uh, clinical depths because one of the uh, challenges associated with this type of screening is being able to image a tumor that's buried under uh, a certain uh, several centimeters of tissue, for instance. And so we have excellent uptake in a mouse, but as you can imagine, the length scales that you're imaging in a mouse are much smaller than what we would have in a human. Uh, so we're building these models. Uh, I didn't, I'm not going to uh, talk about it um, extensively, but another indication we're going after is rheumatoid arthritis. And so we do have the model built here. That's what I'm showing in the picture on the right, where we're looking for inflamed regions of the joint. Uh, and we're going to be doing this for breast tumors as well uh, at clinical, uh, clinically relevant depths to determine whether we can detect these tumors when they're buried under, say, a, a few centimeters of tissue uh, in the clinic. And so that allows us to scale our mouse work up to what we'd expect to see in the clinic. Okay, thank you. Um, so do we have any questions? Uh, please state your name and affiliation when you're asking a question. Kath? So it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. Can you say what this molecule is um, at all, or something about the chemistry if you're unable to say what exactly the molecule is? Yes, absolutely. Great question. I did not put the, the structures up here, but the uh, initial molecule, it binds to a cell adhesion molecule known as uh, integrins. And these are present on many different uh, types of cancers, but also tumor blood vessels, which we think is an advantage for this probe because uh, the tumor blood vessels are less susceptible to variability in the clinic. And so we believe that uh, this will detect most cancers, most breast cancers. And it was initially developed as a uh, therapeutic by Merck, uh, and they published on this in the literature. And so very similar molecules have already gone into the clinic, and they uh, have demonstrated uh, a good and excellent safety profile there. The problem was they failed because they had a lack of efficacy. And that's actually an advantage for what we're trying to do because we don't want any sort of therapeutic effect. We just want it to bind the target. So there was uh, an initial publication there, and then it was converted into an imaging agent for animals. Uh, and we saw excellent targeting properties, and that's why we selected this as a very promising uh, scaffold or molecule to modify for our approach. And have you now patented for this application then? Uh, so we have uh, talked with a tech transfer office, and, and that is currently um, um, ongoing. Yes. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay. Other questions, Bela? Uh, you uh, answered my first question about, uh, about what kind of compounds these are, but uh, near infrared light, uh, light has a, has a certain depth of penetration, and, and it would be a great thing if you can just kind of X-ray some, uh, somebody with near infrared. It doesn't happen. Uh, what kind of realistic depths are uh, are you able to uh, to measure? Uh, with, with this system? Great question. So right now, we believe that we'll be able to get around one to two centimeters uh, through the tissue. And so there are clinical examples of that. For instance, there are published reports with uh, indocyanin green, ICG, uh, that is already a clinically approved floor for. It doesn't target any specific molecules. But for instance, there's been reports where they looked at blood flow in the surface of the brain. So they are able to see uh, from shining near infrared light from the surface of the body through the skull uh, to the surface of the brain. So uh, that's one clinical example where we believe uh, we can attain uh, these types of depths. There's also been a publication with ICG, uh, and again, this is the uh, clinically approved agent, so that's why a lot of the clinical studies have been done with this, uh, where they were looking at rheumatoid arthritis. So delivering ICG to see if they could detect changes in the joints uh, very early on. So again, uh, we're talking about depths of maybe one or two centimeters. What I really envision, and uh, I didn't mention it, um, it was on one of the slides, that this could be paired very well with ultrasound. So another advantage, so there's no ionizing radiation here with the near-infrared light, which is one of the advantages for screening. Uh, also, ultrasound is a very safe um, method in order to image, but like mammography, you don't get any molecular information. 
So what we believe by pairing these two agents together, you get a very high definition of a particular lump, let's say in a breast, with ultrasound, but no molecular information. If you put both modalities in the same instrument, you would then get a signal. So near-infrared light would be very diffuse, right? So it's like seeing light through a shower curtain, it's highly scattered. So by combining the two Im images, you get molecular information from the near-infrared light, uh, which might be scattered if we're talking about significant depths, but then we use ultrasound to get uh, more information on the morphology of the lump. So you're basically using it as simultaneously. So, uh Absolutely. So you're using the two together, and there's uh, currently an analogous approach in imaging. So for radioactive agents, which you can't use for screening large populations, but with uh, PET CT or PET MRI, the radioactive probe provides molecular information, and then the CAT scan or the MRI provides high resolution spatial information. So what we're trying to do is somewhat analogous, and we think it would be, work very well because ultrasound is uh, often used already in the clinic to help diagnose some of these lesions. We would be providing the molecular information on top of that. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. Okay. It looks like Kath has another question. Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry again. Um, just to ask what happens to the compound once um, the imaging's been done? How long does it stay in the body and how is it removed? Uh, great question. So this molecule is relatively hydrophilic, meaning it is very water soluble. And so most of it gets filtered out by the kidneys and it's excreted in the urine. Uh, so we have not tracked uh, beyond several days to see how what the residence time in the uh, tumor is. We believe, just based on other probes we've looked at, that uh, the half-life, meaning the time it takes for half of the probe to leave, would be on the order of a day or so. Uh, and so eventually it will leak out of uh, the tumor and wash out of the body. We haven't seen much uptake in other organs, so we've looked at the liver to see if any of it is excreted there uh, and out into the uh, feces, but we haven't uh, noticed any of that with the probe so far. We do see a significant amount uh, cleared in the urine. Uh, and, and that's actually an ideal way of uh, excreting these probes because it is very fast uh, and you remove all the uh, extra probe from the body very efficiently. Okay. So when do you think you will actually move to the clinic and actually test this in people? Uh, that's a great question. It's always very difficult to say. So uh, the two molecules that we've chosen, the fluorophore as well as the targeting ligand, are promising in our minds because uh, similar molecules for the targeting ligand have already gone to the clinic, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, they didn't have a fluorophore on them, and so therefore uh, uh, they still need to be uh, tested by the FDA, considers it a new molecule, but it does seem promising that the initial structure has gone into humans, and they were using therapeutic doses. So uh, on a molar basis, uh, the doses were 100 or 1,000 times higher than what we're using. And so by having a lower imaging dose, uh, we believe there's less of a concern for toxicity. Um, as far as the fluorophore is concerned, that is also in the clinic in Europe. I'm not sure in the United States, but uh, definitely in Europe, that's in the clinic attached to different targeting molecules for an intraoperative application. So there it's delivered intravenously before a patient goes into surgery, and those targeting ligands light up tumors and then the surgeon can remove all, all the tumor. Uh, but it has gone into the clinic there and also again they haven't seen any major safety issues. So although it has to be retested uh, when you have a conjugate, uh, the fact that both the moieties uh, have uh, don't have any major safety liabilities is promising. Now, of course, we need to scale this to other species uh, to see how efficiently it would work in humans, uh, but we're hoping to, uh, to complete that work um, uh, very soon. Okay, we have a question in the back. Christine? Christine Sao, Office of Public Affairs. I was just wondering, um, so most of this work is focused on breast cancer, and also you mentioned the rheumatoid arthritis application. Are there other cancers or other um, conditions that this imaging agent could possibly use, be used for? Yeah, so, so we're looking at all the options, and I, I guess since you asked the question, I'll briefly state why we believe uh, rheumatoid arthritis is another good application. So the idea behind our uh, targeting there is that um, there's a lot of interest in the uh, RA fields, so rheumatoid arthritis, in early detection. So uh, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune reaction where the immune system is attacking the joints. And so 
uh, a lot of the damage caused by that disease is irreversible. But we have effective treatments to stop that damage. So there's a lot of interest in the community if we can detect this early and possibly even preclinically before the patients show any symptoms. Uh, if then we can put them on what are known as these disease-modifying drugs, we can prevent them from ever getting the disease because we shut down the immune system before it causes any of this damage. And so that's why we feel this would be a, a great second application uh, that we're looking into. Beyond that, we have considered other diseases. Uh, these, I think, will be the highest impact, which is why we've started with them. Uh, and the major limitation, going back to one of the questions that was asked earlier, is that we need to have diseases where the site that we're imaging is relatively close to the surface. So unfortunately, I don't believe we could use this, uh, for instance, for pancreatic cancer or any other cancers that are, let's say, deep in a body cavity because of this issue with the diffuse scattering and absorption of light through very thick tissues. Uh, but you can imagine any other cancer that is really close to the surface uh, would be amenable to this type of uh, technology. Okay. If those are all the questions, then thank you very much for joining us. And the archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly slash ACS Live San Diego. Please join us for our next press conference today at 2.30 on a nanoparticle that can image and treat atherosclerosis. Thank you.